Okay, so dear Dhamma practitioners, be comfortable yourself and relax your body and keep your back straight, make it straight in one line and your right palm on your left. So gently close your eyes and bring your attention to this bell sound and while you're focusing to the sound, mentally relax your body, relax your mind and relax your breathing with your thoughts. So do nothing extra. Just follow the sound please. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed One, the Exalted One, the Fully Enlightened One. So dear Dhamma practitioners, before we start our practice session, as usual we'll take few minutes to understand how this meditation will help for us to develop our conventional life and out of that conventional development, how we can gain our spiritual success. So you have to remember there are many ways that you can develop your conventional life. And sometimes it different person to person. And at the same way, the spiritual path also people can take in many ways. So somehow, it is very important to have the open mind and get out of the self-centered mind or the egocentric mind because the egocentric mind can do two things. One is it block your own inner development. It don't allow you to develop from inside you. As example, whatever you know, it not your egocentric mind not allow you to grow yourself with the, whatever the knowledge or the wisdom you carry. And other thing is, your egocentric mind not allow this outside wisdom or the knowledge to come to you. So this both can happen. So that's why it's always very important for yourself when it comes to practice and in day-to-day -day life. Look into yourself and get out of this self-centered, egocentric mind. Keep the openness. Have the adaptivity. Willing to change. Willing to adapt. And sometimes negotiate. With what you know. And sometimes to drop what you know. Because maybe the ignorance our own ignorance, we can hold as our wisdom. So then if you don't drop it, you will never get out of it. So that's why there are places that we can see, we can grow, we can understand that how the life behaves 
how the life happens. So one is the hospital. So if you visit the hospital, that you will recognize the very nature, the very behavior of this life. Another one is the school. If you go to, go to the school and you will know that there are a lot of things beyond your mind. Another one is the prison. So if you go to the prison and you will see and sometimes that whatever you think right is not work in the world and maybe the world take it as wrong. So these three places allow us to in a very conventional level to have this open mind. And these three places will help us to get out of our egocentric, self-centered mind. When it comes to this human life, it's kind of like a, the, the, this human life is like a tree. So the, from the beginning, these philosophers used to think this tree is kind of like a very independent and it can grow to certain level and hold the roots itself. And according to the strength of the roots, and uh, it can maintain the tree. So it's kind of like they thought it is a very independent existence. But by the time they found out these redwood trees and it completely changed their idea about these trees because the redwood trees, the roots, rather than go deeper, the roots go around and get tangled, hold with the, each other. And all the trees, the roots connect each other. And it go more than any other tree, it can grow higher. And all the high wind and the uh, the bad weather, it can resist. So, our human life the same. When we have the openness, when we get connect with each other, when we share things each other, we become stronger and uh, it allow us to grow higher. But if you just be just yourself, of course, you can have a life, but it not allow you to grow. So then always remember, when it comes to dharma, it is not something very complicated, mysterious thing. It's very simple. But what is complicated? Our thought pattern, our own mind, our, our thinking behavior, our thinking pattern, our habits, those are the very complicated, mysterious. So otherwise, when it comes to life itself, when it comes to nature itself, when it comes to dharma itself, it's very simple. So during Buddha's time, there was there were another group of people used to practice different religion and uh, by the time what happens people start to reject them they people didn't accept them that that much and most of time they used to go to the buddha's followers 
So then one day they gathered and they had the conversation and thought, oh, this way we can't survive because everybody go behind the Buddha's follow, uh, the Buddha's students. It is better one of us go to the community of the Buddha's Sangha and learn what they practice. Otherwise, we can't survive. And then you can come back and teach it to us. It's kind of like a spy. So this, then they, in that group, there was a kind of like a well-educated, you know, uh, kind of like a yogi. It's name called Susina. So they selected him. Okay, you go. You go to the, the community of the Buddha and then learn and all the secret techniques and come back. Then we can then be like the same. So this Susima, this yogi, he went to Venerable Ananda and told he want to become a monk. And Venerable Ananda knew he came from another tradition. But still what he did, he took him to the Buddha and told, oh, this Susima uh, want to become a monk. So normally Buddha used to keep, uh, if, if uh, another religious person come from another school, if there is a person come to community of the Sangha, four months, five months, keep a kind of like a very training period. But the Buddha right away told to Venerable Ananda, okay, you, you know, welcome. Make him a monk. Maybe Buddha knew that he's a well-educated person even though he didn't know the very basic foundation of the Buddha's teaching and uh, he was trying to, to spy and kind of like uh, get all the, the secret and try to, to, to go back. Even But Buddha said, let him to become a monk. So then he became a monk. So by the time what happened? Now he go here and there. Now his intention is getting all the secrets. So then he always, you know, look into. And then he saw sometimes these monks come to Buddha. And then the Buddha say, oh, you are enlightened. And then uh, another monk comes sometimes. Oh, then Buddha said, you are enlightened. So this Susima, this venerable Susima, now he's a monk. So he start to look, what is this? How they come to like this? What is this enlightenment? Is there any special skill, knowledge, kind of like a wisdom, high mental powers that they carry within themselves? like reading minds or showing miracles or kind of like that. Because sometimes they come and Buddha say, you are enlightened. And then Buddha, that Venerable Susima went to these monks and asked, hey, I heard that you are enlightened. Oh, yes, of course. Can you show this miracle, that miracle? Then this monk told, oh, no, I don't know about that. So like that he go place to place, place to place and ask him from this enlightened monks about these miracles and high mental powers and kind of things. But uh, most of time and uh, he couldn't find anything like that. Now he had a question, what is this enlightenment then? What is this? So then he had a conversation with the Buddha. So then in that conversation, and the Buddha mentioned to him, taught him to observe very carefully. Observe the body itself, sensation itself, 
feelings itself, breathing itself. So this is a very important point that you have to understand. What here the Buddha taught to him to observe. This most of time we misunderstand. Because when we observe, we mostly think about it. We have kind of like a preconditioned mind, even regarding the impermanence, unsatisfactory nature, and selflessness. So if you thinking to see impermanence and observe, you're not going to see that what is exactly impermanence. What you see, that what you know about impermanence, maybe you're going to see through it. So, when we see something with the knowledge of unsatisfactory nature, and when you observe the body, the feelings, breathing, sensation, thoughts, Maybe you see unsatisfactory nature through it, but it is not the real unsatisfactory nature. That unsatisfactory nature is what you think as this is unsatisfactory nature. And selflessness. Now you have kind of like an idea. Selfless. What is selflessness? Maybe verbally you have a kind of like a, a idea about it. So with that idea, when you observe, you always look for that. So this is a very important thing when you practice meditation, especially when it comes to the vipassana level of meditation. When you observe thoroughly, deeply, you have to remember to withdraw that your all the preconditioned mind or the concept or the understanding or the believing or the following system, which we don't like to do. Why? Because what we know, we always hold it to it. But what the Buddha taught to this venerable Susima to told him just to observe. And when, when he observed what happened, so this, the four elements, heat, motion, liquidity, and hardness. So, if you observe something, you can see that. And the heat itself going to show the arising and disappearance. Motion itself will show how it arises itself and disappears. Liquidity itself, that nature itself will show how things arising and disappear. The hardness itself will show how things arise and disappear. So it is not that you think about impermanence, unsatisfactory nature, selflessness. So when you are capable to observe, so as a result of that observation, you are capable to see how things arising and disappear. You are capable to see the impermanence. It is not that you understand. It's not kind of like uh, you know about oh, everything impermanent. And now with that idea, you look into something. So everything selfless, with that idea you look into, no, 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 that is very wrong. 
This is why you have to be very clear. Even though that you know as only practice point of view we, we talk like this, when it comes to your own practice, you have to drop this. Otherwise that what you know itself becomes the hindrance to your own practice. So, you're observing the body or the breathing or the sensation or the thoughts or the feelings, that whatever, just observe with very plain, very clear mind and see what you, what you can see there. So then by the time itself, it will show you how it arises, how it goes. How it arises, how it goes. And once you see that, you will recognize, you will see what is impermanence. Not what you think as impermanence. So it is totally different. Now, as a knowledge, what we know about impermanence is not the impermanence that you see when you observe. So what you know about unsatisfactory nature is not what you see when you observe. What we know about selflessness is not what you experience when you observe and see through itself what is selflessness. But still we need to know. Why? Because that will open the path. That will help us to practice. That as example, so from here, so from your place, you know that maybe you know how to go to downtown. You are near a city. But that knowing that doesn't mean you are there. When you start to go, it's knowing that as a conventional level that what you know is not going to take you itself to that because moment by moment, step by step, when you make the journey happen, that journey itself is totally different. But still that what you know is important. But that doesn't mean what you know will take you to the city. What you know itself not going to take you. So step by step you have to have the effort, awareness and the clarity and continuous effort to, to keep going with that. So the same thing with this impermanence, unsatisfaction in age and selflessness. So what happens to us? Even the loving kindness, compassion, the same. What happened to us as loving kindness and compassion? So what we think as loving kindness, we think about it. So then we ruminate. So we kind of like we go with the same that idea that we hold as loving kindness. Because loving kindness is not a kind of like idea. It's not a, compassion is not an idea. So that's why practicing is very necessary for a certain level. Not for everybody, but for most of us. Because that to gain that experience, especially get out of this barrier of thoughts, because we always deal with thoughts and 
through from, from childhood to now we used to learn go with thinking and what we think we keep in front of us and go with it but when it come to practice what we what we need to do we have to drop that our thinking mind and with very clear awareness we have to observe And when you observe, you start to see something. So then, now you have to ask a question yourself. When you practice, have you ever saw something itself or are you hold it to thinking and you keep looking that what you think to find somewhere? It's like a, it's like a matching. We we try to match to what you know as impermanence, what you know as selflessness, what you know as uh, that uh, unsatisfactory nature. Are you go, are you matching it with practice, or are you drop it and going to see something? And once you start to see it, once you start to observe, you're going to see that. No one can stop it. Only one person can stop it. It is your own mind. There is no any other person can stop if you very clearly, vigorously, with the effort, if you start to look. Because that, that, that is there. It's not going to come from somewhere else. It's not depending with somebody else. No, it is within you. That is itself you, your nature. So if you look, you will see that. Only thing is if you hold some thoughts and try to look, maybe you're not going to see it. So that's why brush up yourself, clear yourself is the very important technique you have to remember. So for that, you have to take the fully responsibility and uh, we have to, you have to be honest to yourself and you have to give the best when it comes to practice. And with that, if you keep practice, if you keep observe, 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 with each and every experience, you're going to see this. Things arise and disappear. Itself arise, itself disappear. It come without an invitation or the request, itself it will go. Thoughts, the sensation, the feelings, the breathing. So just observe anything, whatever you experience. It will come, it will go. Not permanent. So then it will show you this thing's impermanence. So if you observe, then that where you recognize itself, it will show you it is impermanence, not what you think. Another thing is unsatisfactory nature itself. It is has this unsatisfactory nature. You no need to think about it. So whatever the sensation, the feelings, the body, the mind, the thought, breathing itself, it has this inherent unsatisfaction in it. So when you observe, you see it. You don't need to think about it. What to think? And the selflessness. So everything you have body, the feelings, the sensation, each and every posture, the each and every breathing, each and every thought, itself, this selflessness inherent, inbuilt. So then if you see it very clearly, you're going to recognize that. That understanding is called vipassana knowledge. Now remember, then you don't bring your understanding to something and look it there and match it. No. 
because that is the very nature of the self-centered mind. Our identity. Identity means matching. Matching. When you have ID, so if somebody asks your ID, show, show me your ID. So what they do? They take the card, picture and match it to you. So that's the always the self-centered mind does. Matching. So don't do it when it comes to meditation. Don't do it when it comes to, to vipassana level of practice. Because we used to do that. We are very good to do that. We are very good to, to, to match things. But don't, don't bring that habit here. Withdraw, withdraw your mind. Whatever the mind say, with divorce from it. And be empty, be empty. Learn to learn to see it. without any judgment, without any preconditioned mind. Just observe and keep the equanimity, keep the balance. Don't get into a side. Don't compare to anything. Just observe, observe, observe. Go deeper, deeper. Don't hold it to any idea. Don't hold it to any concept. Don't hold it to any emotions. Don't hold it to any feelings. Don't try to make any comments regarding the moment of your experience. Just be simply observe, observe, observe. And that way you go to the depth. And simply practicing that within your own mind is the, the very key skill of a vipassana. See how beautiful it is. See how clear it is. See that completely your awareness your consciousness, 100%, unbiased, within, even with your own knowledge or the thoughts or kind of like from that. It's become free completely. And then you, it reflect, it, it show you what is this. And once you have that, what happens? Once you see within your feelings, the body, the, the sensation, the breathing, the thoughts, once you see itself it is impermanent, itself it is it has the unsatisfactory nature, itself it has the selflessness, then the detachment happens. It's not kind of like you try to let go of something. So that nature, once you see that itself, you are not going to hold it to it. Detachment happens. And once the detachment happens, ajattava kaya kaya anupasi virati, bahiddava kaya kaya anupasi virati. So first it happened within, inside you, yourself, within your own body, feelings, sensation, breathing, thoughts, kind of like that. And then what happened? You are capable to apply that to outside world. Naturally, it happened with our other others, their feelings, their sensations, their body, their mind. You have no attachment. And then when it comes to the the all the the forms that whatever arise around us, our it form itself, the all the forms that around us. And not only that, in the past, whatever that as a memory that you carry all the names and forms. And then you can see that all the the names and forms that you experience and you hold as your memory also had, had that unsatisfactory nature, selflessness, impermanence. Then your mind detached from that also. And not only that, that whatever that we think about the future, that means our imagination regarding the future, 
all the names and forms. And you can see that itself, it show you unsatisfactory nature, selflessness, impermanence. Then you detach from that also. Near or far. So whatever that the names and the forms around you are far away. So that also you can see this impermanent, unsatisfactory nature, selflessness. So like that it applied to everything that what you experience. So then whatever rise in your mind as name or form, you will see that a right itself showing to you whatever it is impermanence, unsatisfactory nature, selflessness. It has that nature itself. So then you are, even the thought arises, you are not attached to that. And once you have that experience, you are itself liberated. You, you attain to the enlightenment. So, that is a process step by step. So then, remember, this is nothing to do with miracles. This is nothing to do with kind of like a reading others' mind. This is nothing to do with, you know, walk on the water. This is nothing to do swimming on the ground and crossing mountain through the sky. It's kind of like that. It's nothing to do with this. Of course, there are, there are many ways you can develop the mind to develop, gain the high mental powers. But this path Vipassana knowledge is nothing to do with that. This is what you understand. Impermanence, unsatisfactory nature, selflessness. Within your own body, feeling, sensation, thoughts, experience, form, feeling, perception, volition, recognition. Yourself and related to the names and forms related to past or the future and everything. And that is where your mind not going to get tangled to anything. So I hope this will help you to, to, to become clear with yourself and for your own practice. So then when you put it to practice, always remember, be very careful not to bring what you know. Drop it there. Keep the empty mind and just observe breathing in front of your nose and your upper lip area and see through that observation what the breathing going to tell you. So we're going to listen to that now. So your right palm on your left neck, get straight in one line and be comfortable with your posture. So bring your attention to your body and scan head to toes yourself and say, Supateva, oh, may I be well and happy three times. Take a moment and think. We gathered here in this moment to practice this ancient meditation technique. All the Buddhas, all the enlightened masters followed this path and achieved wisdom. So we also gathered here to accumulate that knowledge. In this moment with this sitting, may my body become more comfortable. May my breath be more smooth. May no difficulties come to me. May all the success come to me. Also think for a moment. This is the last moment we're spending in this very lifetime. And detach your mind from all your past memories and as well as any kind of future thoughts. 
Just try to remain in the present moment, observing the sensation of your inhalation and exhalation. So in the beginning, deeply and gently, breathe in, breathe out three times and find the sensation, please. So simply observe the breathing and see what you can recognize there. Do nothing extra. Bring your attention to your body, please. Observe your posture. We cultivate loving kindness and compassion in our heart and radiate it as a light through entire your compound, village, city, state, country, world around this universe. Also as far as you can through galaxies, other planets, the stars. Reminding yourself like this. With clear intention, mentally repeat after me. May all living beings in this universe be well and happy. May everyone be happy and safe. And may their hearts be filled with joy. May all living beings live in security and in peace. Beings who are frail or strong, tall or short, Big or small, visible or not visible, near or far away, already born or yet to be born. May all of them dwell in perfect tranquility. Let no one do harm to anyone. Let no one put the life of anyone in danger. Let no one out of anger or ill will wish anyone any harm. Expand the loving kindness and compassion beginning from your heart. Forward. Visualize yourself and send it as a light. To your backside. To your left side. And to your right side. Downward. Up. 
and upward. To all six directions at once, like the moon, the sun, spread the light, spread the energy without any condition, without any limitation, without any resistance or without any judgment. Let your heart to shine with the loving kindness and compassion from the bottom of it, with the maximum effort to the highest. Wishing yourself, may all living beings in this universe be well and happy. Say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So first of all, we offer this practice to the great qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. Also by the power of this meritorious deed, may all of us attain to the supreme bliss of Nibbana. May all your guardian angels and deities will receive these merits and increase their longevity and protect all of you from any kind of planetary influences or any ill effects. Ittavata chami sampadam punya sampadam sabbe deva numodan tu sabba sampati siddhya sabbe bhuta numodan tu sabba sampati siddhya sabbe satta numodan tu sabba sampati siddhya Nimaya Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipatiya Buddham Pujemi Dhammang Pujemi Sangham Pujemi Adhaya Imaya Patipatiya Jati Jaravya Dimaranam Mahaparibunjissami Idhammi Punya Kammang Asavakkaya Vahanhotu Sabbadukkha Pamunchatu Bless you.